This is part two of our lecture on culture and groups. Another way that people build identities and organize their lives is through group membership, both formal and informal. The reading talks about the role of groups and informal groups in more detail. I don't want to replicate all of that. In this lecture, I will focus more on the sociology of formal groups or formal organizations. A formal organization is a group designed for a special purpose and structured for maximum efficiency. Anything from a school or a Cub Scout troop on the small end to a government or international corporation on the large end counts as a formal organization. Almost all formal organizations also have elements of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, defined by sociologist Max Faber, is a formal organization that uses rules and hierarchy to maximize efficiency. Pretty much any business larger than three or four people needs to become bureaucratic in order to function. But bureaucracies can also be really frustrating to deal with, as anyone who's ever tried to navigate one, which is everyone, knows. The bureaucracy is an ideal type, as Weber describes it. Ideal type was Weber's way of referring to the textbook example of something. It's like a construct or model for evaluating specific cases. When someone says, oh yeah, that's a textbook example of measles, they are referring to an ideal type, a model that we evaluate specific cases against to see how well they fit the mold. The first of the five characteristics of a bureaucracy as an ideal type is division of labor wherein specialized experts perform specialized tasks, and the workplace functions like an assembly line. The assembly line was in introduced to manufacturing by industrialists like Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company, and it represented a big change in how things were made from before the Industrial Revolution of the mid-late 1800s. Before that, most things were made by a single skilled craftsman or woman who would spend years training to be a master builder or carpenter or shoemaker. That person would build a thing from the ground up. The invention of the assembly line changed that. Now you have a conveyor belt and dozens or hundreds of people who are assigned to building just one part, putting in a single screw or making the same two welds over and over again all day for years. This allows products to be made faster. Workers don't even have to stop to change out tools. They just stand there with a bolt gun doing the same three bolts on every automobile frame that comes by them. It's also cheaper because you don't have to hire people with years of training or specialized skills anymore. Workers can be trained in less than five minutes, and you can pay them less and fire them more easily too, because you can train another one in five minutes to do the same job. It's also boring. Karl Marx argued that, under the assembly line system, the worker becomes a mere appendage of the machine, that he becomes alienated from his work and also society, because he has no feeling of ownership over the finished product anymore and feels just like a cog in the machine. Even non-factory bureaucracies show a division of labor, with one division handling sales, another accounting, another advertising, and so forth. Division of labor exists in a bureaucracy because it can make things more efficient, and sometimes it does the exact opposite, because too much specialization can also slow things down. Oftentimes, departments stop being able to communicate with each other, and instead of one, contacting one person to get things done, you have to have five different managers in five different apart departments all signing off on something. The second aspect of a bureaucracy in Weber's formulation is hierarchy of authority. Bureaucracies are essentially hierarchical. Each person is under the supervision of a higher person. There's the boss, then there's the big boss, then there's the big, big boss, then there's the VP, then there's the senior VP, then there's the president, then there's the board, and so on. When you call a tech support helpline or a call center, odds are you'll spend a lot of time on the phone because the first person you'll talk to will be a junior tech who can't do much more than help you reset your password. If it's more complicated than that, he'll escalate you up to his immediate manager who has slightly more power and knowledge, but she also has limited abilities to change things in the system. So then she has to escalate you up to her manager and so on. The benefits of this are supposed to be that you concentrate decision-making power in the hands of someone with authority or experience. The drawbacks, again, are slowness. Hierarchies and the division of labor can also lead to something called diffusion of responsibility. Diffusion of responsibility refers to the fact that individuals are less likely to perceive or take responsibility for their actions when they're acting as part of a group. 
One classic example of diffusion of responsibility from American corporate history concerns the case of the Ford Pinto. From 1970 to 1977, the Ford Motor Company continued to sell its economy car, the Pinto, even after tests conducted by Ford's own safety engineers as the car was being introduced to market revealed design flaws that made the car susceptible to bursting into flame after low-speed rear-impact crashes. Since those same rear-impact crashes tended to buckle the car's lightweight frame, making the doors impossible to open from the inside, there was a risk, company engineers reported, of passengers being trapped inside the burning car, unable to either escape or be rescued. This is a photo of a Ford Pinto during a safety test. Still, the Ford company continued manufacture and sale of the Pinto until a whistleblower, a company insider, leaked company documents showing, showing Ford knew about the risk to journalist Mark Dowie. The most damaging document published by Dowie, from Ford's perspective, was an early memo detailing a cost-benefit analysis. The memo estimated the Pinto's design flaw would cause as many as 180 serious burn injuries and an additional 180 burn deaths. It also estimated it would cost the company $137 million to fix through recalls, production stoppages, and the cost of going to retool and redesign the assembly line that produced the Pinto. But company lawyers and accountants estimated it would cost the company only about $49 million to say nothing and pay off the anticipated lawsuits. Ultimately, Ford went with the second option and kept the Pinto in production for seven more years. No one has a definitive number on how many people actually died in Pinto-related crash fires. 27 is a figure quoted on the low end, whereas higher estimates say over 100. There was one attempt to bring criminal charges against the company in a fire that claimed the lives of three girls, but because they were killed after being rear-ended by a drunk driver, the case didn't meet the stricter criminal law standards for assigning liability. This is an example of diffusion of responsibility because no one person at Ford really made the call to keep the Pinto in production. When safety engineers went to Ford's CEO, Lee Iacocca, with their findings, Iacocca is said to have stormed and said, don't bother me with the details, just get it done. So the safety engineers went back to manufacturing, shrugged, and said, well, I guess the boss wants us to go ahead. When the lawyers and accountants who drew up the cost-benefit analysis were questioned, they shrugged and said, look, we didn't tell them to keep the car in the market. They asked us to figure out what the lawsuits would cost, and we told them. All along the chain, it was someone saying, it wasn't my decision, I wasn't fully informed, I was just doing my job. That's diffusion of responsibility. The more people there are at the table, the easier it is to pass the buck or not take responsibility. And sometimes, that makes it a lot easier to do something immoral. The third feature of bureaucracy as an ideal type is written rules and regulations. One thing that a bureaucracy really excels in is creating rules. Formal rules and regulations are necessary for any institution to function. They also theoretically ensure fairness. If everyone has to pay the same fee to register their car, then the clerk can't just decide to waive it for his friends. They also create institutional memory, ensuring that even though employees may leave, new ones come in understanding exactly what's expected of them in all situations because it's written down. But rules and regulations can also create slowness and red tape and a lot of busy work. If you need something, you can't just call someone and ask for it. You've got to fill out a requisition form and then route that form through several different departments. And it can take weeks or months for the form to be signed off on by all the right people, who then make sure the correct cash source is used to purchase it and that it's purchased from a vendor who's gone through a proper bidding and betting process and so on. The fourth feature of a bureaucracy, according to Weber, is impersonality. Officials perform their duties without giving personal consideration to clients as individuals, and often services are provided anonymously without face-to-face -face interaction. You've probably experienced this already. If you apply to a four-year college, for example, the people who decide whether to admit you or not will never actually meet you. Your application will be processed or read by dozens of people who will check or evaluate one part of it before sending it off to the next person. So, one person will check that your supporting documents are in place before forwarding it to someone who will use a formula to assign a ranking to you based on test scores and GPA and so on. It's the assembly line again. Usually, when you call a large business, whether it's your health insurer or your cable provider, your first contact won't be with a person at all. It'll be with a computer, 
which processes your initial requests or issues and only then routes you to an actual person, usually a lower level employee only empowered to process payments and answer simple questions. Again, this can help to ensure fairness and it facilitates a division of labor, but the experience leaves you feeling dehumanized, like you aren't a person at all, but rather a lot on a spreadsheet, because from the system's perspective, that is what you are. The fifth and final feature of the bureaucracy as an ideal type is employment is based on technical qualifications, meaning your hiring or promotion is supposed to be based on what you know rather than who you know. So your education, your qualifications, your skill set rather than nepotism, and your performance is supposed to be measured against clear written standards. Nepotism refers to the practice among those in power of favoring family members or friends, usually by giving them jobs. Before the Industrial Revolution, and in family businesses even still, a trade is often something you're born into. Your father, or sometimes your mother, would apprentice you, and then you would come to take over the business. People hired members of their families first. That was how it was done, and that was what was expected. In a bureaucracy, such as at a public university or a government office, hiring is supposed to be based on qualifications, not just who you know. Remember, though, this is where the concept of something as an ideal type diverges from how something works in the real world. Because even within the biggest bureaucracies, people do still get a leg up from being related to the boss, or one of her old friends from college. That's an example of what Bourdieu called social capital, getting benefits and advancement through your social networks. The reading talks about something sociologist George Ritzer called McDonaldization. It's actually a very catchy term, and some people now just use it to refer to the spread of big corporate brands worldwide. But in Ritzer's formulization, McDonaldization referred to the process by which the principles of fast food production, or bureaucratization more generally, have come to dominate American and global organizations. As with bureaucracy, there are certain features or tenets of a McDonaldized organization, or a McDonald's. The first is efficiency, the use of assembly line production techniques brought to all aspects of service to maximize speed and profitability. As a restaurant brand, what was revolutionary about McDonald's was its application of the assembly line model, the same one Ford used to make cars, to the production of food. Fast food is all about efficiency. It's the easiest and fastest way of getting from hungry to full. You can order, be served, and finish your meal in less than 20 minutes in about five minutes if you use the drive through and eat in your car. Ritzer argues all organizations are tending toward this model, or at least most of them. At a McDonald's or a Wendy's or any other kind of fast food restaurant, no one person cooks your food. Half of it is actually prepared in a central factory somewhere, and works at the restaurant just apply heat to it and assemble it. You don't get to know the people who serve you. You don't develop a relationship with them. You don't stand around talking to the clerk. You don't sit and linger after you're finished eating. It's all designed for maximum speed. The second and third feature of a McDonaldized organization is calculability and predictability. Calculability means that everything is controlled. In a McDonald's restaurant or any fast food restaurant, the patties are extruded by a machine and calibrated to a fraction of an ounce. They're all the same size, the same fat, salt, and calorie content. Everything is quantifiable and costs and profits are measurable, down to fractions of a cent. It isn't just the food either. The whole restaurant is carefully designed to create a certain experience. And interestingly, that is one aimed at getting you to get in and out as fast as possible. Fast food seats and tables are designed to be purposefully slightly uncomfortable, to discourage people from loitering after they eat. And the restaurants are often just slightly too cold. They want to move you along, not have you taking up space better used by the next paying customer. Most corporations, even those that aren't fast food restaurants, will strive to do the same, calculating, researching, and focus grouping every aspect of the client experience to minimize cost and maximize profit. Second, predictability. There are some regional variations in menu, carefully calculated to boost sales at certain locations. For example, because of religious prohibitions against eating beef or any meat at all by certain religious groups like Jains, McDonald's in India mostly sell burgers made with vegetarian patties or chicken. A McDonald's in Germany will sell beer. But mostly, predictability means that the products and services are the same across any location. Again, 
This is the kind of model that we see being applied from every kind of large business, from fast food restaurants to large for-profit colleges. The final feature of McDonaldization is control through non-human technology. This is the logical extension of the principle of impersonality. A large, modern corporation will maximize profits and ensure total predictability by phasing out human decision-making, or, in some cases, humans themselves. Workers will follow pre-written scripts or prompts on a computer screen telling them what to say or do next with each client or response. Where possible, workers are phased out altogether in favor of touch screens or voice recognition software. Again, this ensures that everyone is treated equally, but it can also be frustrating and impersonal for clients and creates an exceptionally monotonous or alienating experience, as Marx would say, for workers themselves. Or in some cases, it eliminates their jobs altogether. Sociologist Irving Goffman was interested in the meso level of sociology, the function of formal organizations, as well as in the micro level of human interaction. His research on psychiatric hospitals caused him to become interested in the effect that an institution or organization could have on human behavior, and it became so big and powerful that it came to manage every aspect of a person's life. Within what Goffman called a total institution, people are physically and or mentally isolated from the outside world. All social ties are severed, and members are denied access to any frame of reference besides that supplied by the institution. Goffman saw prisons and mental institutions, or psychiatric hospitals, as, as well as organizations like military boot camps, as primary examples of total institutions. Every aspect of the inmate or enlistee's life is controlled by the organization. It tells them how to dress, when and where to eat, sleep, and work. And it may deny them contact with the outside world by restricting their media or internet access, their phone calls, and their letters from home. Total institutions can become very powerful. The Stanford Prison Experiment showed us that. As soon as you cut people off from the outside world and give them only your definition of reality, you can create a situation very similar to what we might call brainwashing, getting them to behave and think in a way they normally wouldn't. For a military boot camp, the benefit of all of this is obvious. You need to take people and get them to think of themselves not as individuals with their own wants and needs, but as members of a unit who can act and think as a unit and unquestionably follow the orders of a superior. So joining a total institution usually requires a process of re-socialization, wherein the individual's identity and sense of individuality are broken down through what is often called a degradation ceremony, i.e. the head is shaved, names are changed, clothes and personal effects are taken away, all of this to strip someone of their basic sense of humanity. From then on, you are usually trained to think of yourself as a member of a group, and often an insignificant one at that. Total institutions are usually totalitarian, dictatorial, or autocratic rather than being democratic, and individuals are encouraged to obey rather than think for themselves. Since a boot camp also has to train people to do things they would normally strongly resist, like kill other people or sacrifice their own lives on the word of another person, this de-individuation and the severing of connections to the outside world assist in this by shutting out alternative voices that might cause you to question or resist what you are being told. When it comes to war, that's necessary. Troops need that level of discipline in order to function in battle. But all these effective means of controlling people mean organizations that function as total institutions can also cross the line fairly easily into becoming what we call a dangerous group. A dangerous, or sometimes called known as a destructive group, is any group which encourages or requires members to engage in behavior that is dangerous to themselves and or outsiders. Examples may include cults, criminal gangs, terrorist cells, or other extremist groups. An example of the destructive power and destructive capabilities of a destructive group comes to us from the 1978 Jonestown Massacre. This picture is an aerial view of the dead from that massacre. The Jonestown Massacre is thought to be the largest mass suicide in history. It claimed the lives of 918 members, men, women, and children, of the People's Temple religious sect. The People's Temple was a religious movement mixed with a social justice movement, 
led by a very charismatic and extremely manipulative man named Jim Jones. Jones started a church in Indianapolis in 1955. It was pretty unusual at the time because it preached equality between all races and was racially integrated at a time when most churches were not. Jones attracted a growing and mixed group of parishioners by preaching a strange blend of traditional evangelical Christianity and revolutionary Marxism. He staged faith healings and preached gospel, but also argued that parishioners had the duty to fight for social justice, to live communally, and to openly share everything they owned. These were not necessarily bad things, but over time, Jones became more and more demanding. He insisted his followers give over almost all their time and assets to the church, and told members he'd had premonitions that the U.S. was about to be wiped out in a nuclear war. Eventually, he insisted the members sell their property, quit their jobs, and moved to an agricultural settlement that he had purchased in the jungles of Guyana, a small Latin American nation. Isolated in the jungle, Jones became more controlling. Using violence and threats of violence to keep members obedient, he recruited members to do heavy labor in the fields for days at a stretch, with no or only a few hours of sleep at night. Sleep deprivation is a common form of torture, also a technique in human control, what we call brainwashing. He withheld food and kept everyone on the verge of near starvation. At night, he made everyone sit up all night some nights in the main dining hall, writing essays on assigned topics, like why they loved Jones and found him sexually attractive, or why they would be happy to give their lives to the movement. Jones preached that the government of the United States was planning to wipe out the settlement and murder Jones and its members, and began telling his members that the only solution for them was to commit a kind of revolutionary mass suicide. After organizing months of suicide drills, wherein members would be instructed to drink flavor aid or a kind of Kool-Aid-like punch that Jones would tell them was laced with poison but really wasn't, one day Jones finally set in motion the whole thing, lining everyone up and instructing them to drink punch laced with cyanide. A few people managed to escape into the jungle. A few others were shot by Jones' armed guards while resisting drinking the punch or trying to run, but most did as they were told, first feeding the poison drink to their children before taking it themselves. Jones then killed himself with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Like any total institution, a destructive group has features that set it apart from other organizations. These features can also serve as red flags, if you find yourself part of a group like this, it's a good idea to carefully consider what it is asking of you, or whether it is safe or beneficial to you or other people. The first is isolation. The group will strip away members' sense of reference or perspective, so that the only source of information or perspective is that of the group or its leader. Again, any total institution will do this to some extent, but a destructive group or cult will do it more dramatically and completely. They want the group to be your whole world. Domestic abusers, incidentally, also do this to their victims, isolating them from friends or family so they are easier to control. The second feature of a destructive group is obedience. Members are required to follow all orders without question. Total institutions more generally, but destructive groups more extremely, also require conformity and what Goldhammer a social psychologist who studies destructive groups call non-thinking from their members. Conformity simply means that differences in opinion or behavior are not tolerated or are punished. People are expected to dress alike, talk alike, and act alike. Non-thinking means that members are told what to think and most decisions are made for them by leadership. It also means that everything is presented to members as very black or white. You're either with us or you're against us. You either follow the word of the leader, or you're going to hell. This is Warren Jeffs, the former leader of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, an extremist and splinter polygamist Mormon group, as well as six of his approximately 70 wives. Jeffs eventually went to jail for multiple counts of felony child sexual assault, both against underage girls who were married to him, some as young as 11 or 12, and also against some of his own children. Like other destructive groups, the FLDS encourages members to follow both conformity and the practice of non-thinking, telling them that their way of life is the only one sanctioned by God, and that the viewpoint of anyone outside the group, so for example, someone who tried to argue that polygamy or engaging in marriage with underage girls is wrong, is actually a messenger sent by Satan to lead them astray. 
in a total institution more generally, but again in a destructive group in far more extreme fashion, members are subjected to excessive demands, meaning that the group requires a sacrifice of all of members' money and free time, and leaders are allowed to intrude into the private lives of members, in some cases to a shocking extent, being allowed to read their personal email, for example, or monitor their internet use, listen to their phone calls, tell them who to marry, for example, or how to raise their children. In a destructive group, the leadership are also given godly status. Leaders are seen as magical or superhuman. Even a country, as the largest example, can operate as a total institution or a destructive group. Kim Jong-un, the dictatorial leader of North Korea, is supposed to, according to state-run propaganda, have invented a drug that cures AIDS, Ebola, and cancer. He is also supposed to have invented the hamburger, and, according to state-run media, has magical powers that mean that he never has to use the toilet. They also claim that he was born atop a North Korean mountain, prompting a double rainbow and a new star to spontaneously appear in the sky. That's a pretty exam extreme example of leadership being go given godly status, but we see it with other kinds of destructive groups too, especially cults or new religious movements, wherein the leader will style him or herself as a prophet who has the full ear of or is practicing the will of God. One thing that tends to set destructive groups apart from normal total institutions is a fixation on persecution and death. All outsiders are treated as the enemy, even when they're former friends or family members. Members are told they're being persecuted or in danger of being killed by outsiders, by authorities, police, or the government. An apocalyptic or end-of-the-world beliefs are very common. The idea of an approaching end of the world has a powerful effect on people because it strips away consequences. If you hurt or kill someone else, it doesn't matter because pretty soon everything will be over and you won't have to go to jail. If your leader tells you to kill yourself, well, you were going to die anyway when the world ended, so what's the big deal? This photo depicts the dead from the Heaven's Gate mass suicide. Heaven's Gate was an American religious group based in San Diego, California, founded by a man named Marshall Applewhite and a woman named Bonnie Nettles. Applewhite, the self-styled preacher of the group, taught members that the end of the world was coming, that it would occur in 1997, and that the only way to escape it was for members to leave their bodies behind and ascend into the sky to meet up with a spaceship that Applewhite told them was invisibly trailing behind the Halley Bopp comet, which astronomers had predicted would be passing within sight of the Earth at that time. In March of 1997, 39 members of the group took phenobarbital, mixed with applesauce and washed down with vodka, and then secured plastic bags around their heads after, the, after ingest, ingesting the mix. Authorities found the dead lying neatly in their own bunk beds, faces and torsos covered by a square purple, purple cloth, an item with religious significance within the group. All 39 were dressed in identical black shirts and sweatpants, brand new black and white Nike athletic shoes, and armband patches reading Heaven's Gate Away Team. Applewhite had borrowed heavily from Star Trek's fictional universe in coming up with his own unique religious cosmology. Many of these examples are tragic, but they also serve to illustrate some fundamental lessons about the power of social forces to shape human behavior, both for good and otherwise, that we will continue to explore over the course of the semester. This concludes this lecture. Thank you for listening.